me introduce to you uh, two of our partners here in, in Ottawa, um, Karen Hennessy and Carol Shrina. Um, Karen is the head of our uh, corporate commercial group uh, across Canada. Um, her practice covers a, a quite a broad spectrum of corporate and commercial matters, including mergers and acquisitions and commercial transactions, leasing, franchising, and, uh, and, and putting together complex uh, commercial agreements. Carol, on the other hand, is uh, our, our top advisor in the tax area, which uh, uh, when it comes to foreign investment, is a lot more exciting than it might be in terms of local interest. But, but Carol's uh, experience uh, over the years has been in, in tax structuring and planning, both for domestic companies and companies uh, uh, and, and, and that are going international. So let me turn the podium over to Karen and Carol. Um, so thanks everyone and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all back to Canada. Um, we've heard from our colleagues and partners around the world about the opportunities for your business uh, globally, um, which gives you a good sense now of, of why you might want to take your company international um, uh, to take advantage of those opportunities. We're going to bring it back um, to a Canadian perspective um, and answer some of the other questions that um, you may be thinking such as you know, timing, when is the right time to take your company global? Um, how do I get there? You know, meaning what is the right business vehicle um, that you should take? Um, which country do you go to? Um, and finally, some of the Canadian legal issues that you need to consider um, even when you're doing an outbound uh, investment. So the first question is, goes to timing. Um, when, you know, there's no magic to, to when you do it. Um, I would say, though, that before you go global, you want to make sure that your domestic business is solid and you have a good foundation um, and that you have the necessary resources. You know, going global is an ambitious task for a business um, and it's going to take a lot of your financial and human resources um, away from your domestic business. So, you know, if you already have um, your personnel, you know, are already, you know, overwhelmed by the Canadian business, um, it's probably not a good time to ask them to, you know, take on international initiative. It's make sure you have the right people um, and the right focus so you can, you can pursue the international initiatives but, you know, are going to erode your Canadian business. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to saturate the Canadian market entirely. Um, you know, throughout your business cycle, you know, it may, be, it may be great to go early, you just need to make sure that you have a good foundation here. Um, you also need to properly plan. We've heard from most of our colleagues about diligence required um, and that before you venture, you need to make sure you, you properly plan and do your due diligence in the countries that you're targeting. Um, so then, you know, what do, how do I get there? You know, what's the right business structure you're going to use um, in that country? We've heard from our colleagues that you know, in, in most countries um, around the world, or the ones that we've talked about, um, there's various uh, business uh, structures you can use, including importing or distributing directly into the country from Canada, um, opening an office, um, or acquiring a business in that foreign entity. From a Canadian perspective, one of the things that you're, the biggest factors of which vehicle is going to be tax related, um, for which I will turn over to Carol, who will um, give you the, the tax perspective from Canada. Thank you, Karen. Um, just before I get into my comments, I thought I would give you a few statistics. Um, the charts and the, um, and the graphs are fairly self-explanatory but I think they serve a uh, purpose of putting our comments into, uh, into context. So the first, um, sorry, this first uh, chart um, uh, graph shows the uh, stock of direct investment uh, made by Canadian companies going abroad. And basically what you can see is that over a 20 year period, um, there has been a growing trend um, so if we look at 2012, we're looking at approximately an investment of 700 to 800 billion dollars. 
Moving on to the next chart, which shows the Canadian direct investment abroad by selected industries. Sorry, this is reverberating. Um, so in the finance and insurance uh, sector, you can tell that as a percentage of total stock, we're looking at an investment of about 39.9%. Uh, mining oil and gas continues to, be, uh, continues to be a sector of investment for Canadian companies abroad. And from there, it, um, it's reducing, uh, reducing investments. This next uh, chart shows the capital invested by type of business organizations. Um, the statistics go back to 2010. I don't have anything more recent, but not surprisingly, most Canadian businesses, when they're investing abroad, are doing so by way of a subsidiary. Not that many are going by way of uh, branches or, or uh, head office. And finally, the last uh, statistics uh, so slide, sorry, uh, gives you a sense of the profit that's generated by foreign direct investment. Um, so Canadian direct investment abroad has uh, increased over the last 20 years. There was a drop in 2002, and there's also uh, a drop in, not surprisingly, in 2009 due to the economic uh, situation. So, uh, moving on to some of the fundamental questions um, that you should be addressing if, uh, as a Canadian business, you're looking to go abroad. Um, many of these questions have already been touched upon by our colleagues in the other countries. Uh, from a corporate perspective and from a regulatory perspective, I'm coming at these questions from a tax perspective because the tax planning around a business going abroad is also uh, important. Except maybe in Dubai, Tim, I guess there's not a lot of uh, planning for me to do if a Canadian business is going into Dubai, except from the Canadian perspective, um, which makes it much simpler, I guess. Um, so some of the important questions, uh, obviously you want to obtain very specific and detailed uh, tax advice and other advice if uh, you're a Canadian company going outbound. Um, amongst, the, um, amongst the fundamental questions is obviously, and this is important from a corporate, regulatory, and tax perspective, is what is the best vehicle, what's the, from a tax perspective, what is the most tax efficient vehicle uh, for the business uh, going, uh, going abroad? You know, is that a, a representative office, is it a branch, is it a subsidiary, or um, a joint venture? Also, how can a company, how can a Canadian company uh, tax efficiently expand into a foreign market or utilize a foreign enterprise? Should it set up its own business in that country? Should it partner with an existing business? Should it acquire shares of an existing business or assets of an existing business? Um, again, there are regulatory uh, aspects to that question, but there are also tax aspects to that question both from a Canadian tax perspective and also from a foreign tax perspective. So from the perspective of the tax regime in that particular jurisdiction. Um, another question, what options does a Canadian company have to finance the business operations or acquisition? So obviously it needs to be a finance. You need to inject funds probably. Is it best to do it by way of equity? Is it best to do it by way of loan? What's most tax efficient? Is there, is there a preferred uh, tax way of, of financing that business abroad? Another question, how can you re repatriate the money to Canada? What we mean by that is you have that business abroad. It has profits. Um, obviously, you want some of the profits, maybe all of it, maybe some of it, to come back to Canada. How do you do that in a tax efficient way? Uh, and that involves considering the tax implications in Canada and in that country. And finally, what is the exit strategy? Um, so you've been in that country for a number of years. The Canadian business has had uh, operations in that country. And for whatever reasons, they've decided that they want to move to another country or alternatively, um, they want to close down the operations What's the best way of, uh, of doing that? 
Uh, some of the Canadian tax considerations, um, <laughs> these are select Canadian tax considerations. We could be speaking about the tax considerations for uh, a whole day, especially if you wanted to talk about the foreign affiliate regime, uh, which I don't intend to do today. So these are really two select tax considerations uh, of many. Uh, one of them is transfer pricing, obviously. Transfer pricing rules require that uh, pricing for goods or services as between a Canadian parent company and a subsidiary or other entity in, in, um, in another jurisdiction have to be at arm's length fair market value pricing. And the reason for that is if we didn't have these rules, um, you could manipulate where you would pay the tax and you would obviously pay the tax in the lowest tax jurisdictions, which today is Dubai. So in the absence of transfer pricing rules, you would ensure that most of your profit uh, of your whole enterprise is taxed in the jurisdiction where you've got the lowest tax rate. And this is where the transfer pricing rules come into play and uh, indicate that um, if you try to do that, these rules will apply so that you can't manipulate uh, your overall tax, uh, uh, taxes paid. Um, now, Canada has transfer pricing rules. Other countries also have them. So um, uh, when you're pricing the exchange, of, uh, the exchange of goods and services, you have to take into consideration both the Canadian transfer pricing rules and also the foreign tax uh, uh, transfer pricing rules. And just before I move on, we do have in Gallings a dedicated transfer pricing group. So that's all they do is transfer pricing uh, reviewing of transactions to make sure uh, as between in the multinational uh, context as between Canadian companies and companies outside of Canada all they do is review them from the perspective of transfer pricing rules and whether they comply another select Canadian tax consideration has to do with uh, foreign currency transactions Transactions that are uh, recorded by a Canadian company in a foreign currency, and many Canadian companies, if they have operations outside of Canada, will report in their own uh, financial reporting, internal reporting, they will report transactions in the foreign currency. Unfortunately, for tax purposes, for Canadian tax purposes, those transactions need to be reported in Canadian dollars. And depending on whether or not uh, there is a timing issue between the time that this is reported for Canadian tax purposes and the time that the payment is actually received from the foreign uh, corporation, from your subsidiary, there may be a, um, a fluctuation in the currency which would give rise to either an exchange gain or an exchange loss for tax purposes. So just uh, one example before um, I give the podium to Karen again. Um, one example of a Canadian income tax, the Canadian income tax implications of a direct investment. Um, so the example I'm working from here is a Canadian company that finances subsid a subsidiary, pick whatever country, uh, via equity. So it basically is buying shares and interest-bearing loans, so also supporting um, its uh, subsidiary by way of loans. The Canadian company grants the subsidiary licensing rights to use the intellectual property um, to carry on the manufacturing activities in the foreign uh, jurisdiction. And the subsidiary pays to the Canadian parent interest, royalties, and dividends. So from the Canadian tax perspective, uh, there would be no immediate Canadian income tax uh, to the parent if the subsidiary earns income from active business. Now generally that will be the case. If that is not the case, if the income or part of the income that's earned by the subsidiary is not from active business, there are certain rules that may tax the income to the Canadian parent, although it's earned outside of Canada by a separate entity. So um, uh, generally not an issue if it's an active, active operation. Uh, however, if it's not, then there could be some, uh, some adverse uh, tax uh, implications in Canada. 
Dividends that are paid by the subsidiary are taxable unless, they're taxable, sorry, to the Canadian parent, unless those dividends are paid out of exempt surplus. What's that? Well, that's basically your active business income. So if the dividends paid by the subsidiary to the parent are paid out of that active business income, there will be no tax payable by the Canadian parent. And finally, the interest and royalties that are paid by the subsidiary to the Canadian parent company, um, those, those will be taxable to the, Canadian, um, to the Canadian company. However, they will be taxable both in Canada and in the foreign jurisdiction because there's usually a non-resident withholding tax. Um, so what happens is to avoid double tax because it's been taxed in the foreign jurisdiction and also in Canada is that Canada will, through its tax regime, uh, provide a foreign tax credit uh, to compensate for the withholding tax that was, um, that was paid to the foreign jurisdiction. And that's it. I will give the podium now to Karen. All right, so the big question is, where do I go? You know, we've heard some very compelling pitches from my colleagues around the world about, you know, why their country should be the one you go to first. Um, uh, you, know, but that, you know, the decision though, you know, but we also know from them and from just reading the news that the international uh, and global economy and political climates are constantly changing um, and therefore um, the pros and cons of a particular jurisdiction is going to change um, uh, and those changes that, you know, are really happening day to day um, as, we're, as we're hearing. So the right country for your business for expansion is going to depend a lot on the type of business that you um, have. Uh, we had a question earlier about goods versus services that may be a particular consideration about uh, where you're um, going to expand. Um, there's also some legal uh, considerations for you, um, and unfortunately I don't have any answers for you here, but I'm going to give you a number of questions that you're going to have to ask yourself in order to make um, that decision. Um, one is, what are the regulatory approvals required in the foreign country? Um, we've heard from our, our colleagues about um, CETA, um, we know about NAFTA, you know, what are the foreign trade arrangements um, in those that um, will make your ease of investment into that country um, uh, you know, better or, or worse. Um, if your business is very personnel heavy, you know, so you're a, a service business or a, a sales business where you really rely on, on employees, um, what are the labor and employment laws in the country that you're thinking of? Um, we already heard how China um, and France, even though they tried to pretend it wasn't so, are very employee friendly. Um, so if you're a uh, employee-heavy business, um, those are jurisdictions you're going to really want to investigate. Um, an obvious question are where are your customers? You know, that would be an obvious um, question to ask and you're going to go where your customers are. Um, what are the tax rules in the other country? We just heard from Carol about uh, the possibility of dual taxation. So is there a tax treaty with that foreign jurisdiction to make sure you're not going to be paying uh, dual tax on your income? Um, so the bottom line is, you know, the right country is going to be different for every business. Um, and for your particular business, the right country may actually change over time um, as the, the new political regimes are, are, you know, exiting and entering the various countries. Um, so as we heard, you know, from I think every presentation, due diligence is key uh, and making sure that your diligence is, is up to date and current. Um, So what else do I need to worry about? Um, there's a few considerations um, legally that actually apply to some Canadian laws that you may not realize are going to apply to your foreign company. Um, so international contracting um, is very different um, in some ways from domestic contracting. Um, while for the most part, as we've heard, you're, you're pretty much free to contract for your you know, normal business terms, um, any contracts with foreign entities um, could automatically have the application of a, the UN Convention on the International Sale of Goods. Um, that convention uh, creates a uniform international sales law which regulates rights and obligations of buyers and sellers um, in any international transaction. 
Canada has been a signatory to that convention since 1992, and the convention has now been adopted uh, by over 80 countries worldwide. So it is very likely that the country that you're dealing with is a, uh, a signatory and has adopted that convention. Um, and the thing to be aware of if, in that convention is that if both countries are signatories, your contract will automatically be subject to um, the rules of the convention unless your contract very expressly and explicitly excludes the application of the convention. Um, you've probably seen in a lot of your contracts some boiler, you know, what you thought was boilerplate language saying the UN Convention on the National Sale of Goods does not apply. Um, that is very key um, uh, if, if you don't want it to apply because of the, the automatic rules. Um, uh, and the reason why you want to exclude it is you may prefer your domestic law um, certainty over contractual provisions. Um, uh, and, and prefer the law of, of the, one of the contracting parties. Similar uh, or a related issue in international contracting is um, conflict of laws rules. Um, those are the rules that uh, really just, you know, define which laws govern the contract um, and you know, which laws will settle any disputes um, relating to the contract. Um, to avoid uncertainty uh, or unpredictable judicial interference in international transaction, you need to make sure that you have governing law clauses in your contract that will expressly state which laws will not only govern the contract, but which laws and which courts will hear a dispute. Um, that being said, you know, make sure, again, you do your due diligence. As we heard from Jamie this morning, um, China, uh, uh, you, know, you know, unless you're using Chinese law, they may not enforce a Canadian contract you know, in China. Um, other jurisdictions as well will say, you know, I don't care what your contract said, I'm you know, exercising my inherent jurisdiction. So again, just be aware of the exclusions to those um, governing law clauses and the enforceability of them. Uh, another consideration in contracts is language. Um, are there any requirements in that foreign country that the language of the contract must be in the foreign language? Um, we heard uh, from one of our speakers that um, it is often, you know, in China that the contract is in both Chinese and English, um, uh, and, but which one prevails because you may have translation issues. So again, these are, you know, issues that you need to make sure you deal with so there isn't uh, uncertainty in the future. Um, another issue to consider is intellectual property protection. We've heard from all of our speakers today about IP rights, um, and the general rule, as most of you probably know, is that your trademark and patent registrations in Canada do not give you any worldwide rights. Um, rights are based on actual use in the, uh, in the country. So one of your first steps before you enter a foreign jurisdiction is going to be to search, you know, and confirm that you can, can secure your, you know, those trademarks, those other IP rights, um, and take the steps to actually um, put them in place before you start carrying on business. Um, when you're looking at your, your trademark uh, rights as well, one thing to take into account is uh, uh, the translation of your trademark in those foreign entities. Um, that'll be a, one of the factors you're going to look at about you know, whether to go is, is find out what your trademark means in the foreign language. Um, I think there's been some very surprising uh, results in some companies that were caught off guard. You know, that their, their Canadian trademark, which was very clever here, meant something very, very different uh, in other jurisdictions. Um, we heard a lot about employment and immigration laws. Um, uh, and you know what uh, what those mean in the foreign country. Keep in mind that it's not just the employment laws there. It's how are you going to get your Canadian employees to that foreign country to set up the business, um, train the employees, um, and what do the immigration laws of that country say as far as you know entry um, and the ability to work. Um, there's also education of your employees who are traveling on you know simply what do you say to the customs agent who is you know, uh, inspecting you on entry, you know, you know, making sure they're not saying, oh, I'm coming to, um, you know, China to work, you know, it's, no, you're on a business trip, you know, um, so it's little things like that that, you know, you can prevent a lot of um, issue as long as you're aware. Um, and then compliance with Canadian law. So there's a number of Canadian laws that actually affect, you know, outbound investment. Um, one that we've heard about this morning, um, and is probably the most obvious to you, is the Canadian anti-bribery and corruption rules. Um, as we've heard, um, and as you would know, in many countries, you know, facility payments are an acceptable way of doing business. Um, but 
uh, from a Canadian perspective, uh, they are not. Um, and the Canada Corruption of Foreign Public Officials Act um, has worldwide reach and prohibits the giving, offering, or agreeing to give or offer a loan, reward, advantage, or benefit of any kind to a foreign public official or to any person for the benefit of a foreign public official, directly or indirectly, to obtain or retain an advantage in the course of business. Um, it's extremely broad reach. Um, and what that means is if your subsidiary is um, giving bribes in the foreign country, the parent company here in Canada is the one that's going to be liable and can be held accountable um, in Canada. Um, privacy and data protection, we heard a lot about that in our global world. You know, data and personal information um, is, is constantly kind of in you know, transition and, and making sure that you're following the laws of Canada about any pri uh, personal information that you're sending overseas. And there's lots of requirements to make sure you um, fulfill. Um, and likewise, what are the rules of the foreign country for exporting personal information? Um, so if you have, you know, making sure your customer databases, if they need to be segregated, they are, um, or you're, or you're um, uh, you know, in fulfilling the obligations for both countries on any data transfers. Um, export issues, um, you know, an obvious thing to take into account is, is the foreign country under, 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 under any kind of economic sanctions or embargoes from Canada? Um, and you know, if your business is, uh, is one um, where our controlled goods regime uh, would take an effect, there are specific rules about the export of goods, uh, which applies primarily in the um, security, uh, national defense, or military applications, but, but not only those. So again, making sure that you know, you're actually able to export the goods from Canada. Um, and it's not just goods, sometimes it's intellectual property. You know, exporting from Canada can be regulated. Um, so those are, again, a very high-level snapshot of some of the things I have to think about from a Canadian outbound perspective. Um, every business is different, and there's no way that we can you know, get the full scope of all the issues in today's presentation. Um, but uh, we are here to help um, navigate them and fine-tune them for everybody. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Scott, who can wrap up um, uh, and... You know, again, I assume, il you know, illustrate again how we can help. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Well, thanks very much, uh, Karen and Carol. Uh, and, and before we go any further, let me take a minute to thank our uh, speakers from around the world. Um, you've dedicated a lot of time to this, and, uh, and we really appreciate uh, you participating. Um, the, uh, you know, if our experience is uh, any indication, uh, uh, going international um, is a tremendous advantage, uh, and uh, it w it's been handled very successfully by the Gowling WLG firm, and, uh, and we'd like to help you do the same. Let me end by saying thank you to you for your patience. It's been, uh, uh, I guess, two and a half hours <laughs> of, of your time, and uh, we uh, are really glad that you were here. Thank you very much. And thank you, Galling WLG, around the world. Thank you.